All right, I think we should get going. We've got people, uh, still a couple of people coming in. So Rick, if you can keep an eye on that. Yep, I great. got it. I'll leave it. So, okay, welcome, welcome. This is gonna be a very relaxed session, really, which is what I, you know, it, this came about um, a couple of times I've been asked when I've been at events um, or just talking to people, they've asked me how, how, how I started in project management as far as the books are concerned, how the latest project manager came about um, and, just lots of questions and it just suddenly thought well you know it's interesting when i when i did write the lazy project manager and, and you yeah, know rick can talk about this later on what his experiences were but you know i had no idea <laughs> about publishing at all and and i kind of just fell into it and i was kind of lucky i guess in what happened um but as part of that i thought <clears throat> it'd be really good because i've worked with you know i've known rick for a long time we worked together in the past um, I just thought it'd be good if you know a couple of people came together who had some experience in in writing um, in the project management world to just talk about it, share our experiences, and you know maybe inspire. They, they can you know hopefully out there is the next lazy project manager book, you know, or, or, or even better. So that's what this is all about: writing and getting published in the project world. Um, now Rick and I have a whole bunch of books together. I'm you know I've just put a few of mine up um, up there, but you know that's just some examples. <clears throat> um, you know, the Lazy Project Manager was the first and, and still the biggest seller for me. Um, I've had a lot of fun with the Project Manager who smiled, a lot of success with Lean Successful PMOs. I had a lot of fun writing Project Management. It's all bollocks um, with uh, a good friend of mine, Susie Palmer True. And there are many other books as well. And we're going to talk about our books as we go along. So, you know, we've got a track record, um, you know, out there in the world of Project Management. I guess we are seen as pretty successful. But there are some things we can do and some things we can't do. And so uh, I just, you know, it's, I don't want to be hard here, but, you know, I want to be clear on what we what we can't do. So, we, you know, Rick and I aren't looking to find co-authors at the moment. We also have our own projects that we're ongoing. We can't help you find a publisher. Um, we can't make introductions or recommendations. And we probably can't even read all your books if you write one. But so that's the honest situation. But what we hope we can do is share our experience with you and inspire you and help you to write the next book in that way. And so that's what that's, you know, that's the kind of positioning statement. Now, thanks for those of you who did the kind of survey that I sent out, very simple one question survey. I, I was just interested, you know, was, were we going to have a group of people turn up who had never written anything? Or do we have a bunch of people turn up who had written some things, et cetera? And I ask these kind of questions like, you know, have you commented on someone else's blog? Um, quite, you know, mo most of you have. Most of the people who registered for the event have. Um, you know, have you written a blog yourself? Quite a lot of people have written a blog. And so that's, that's where I started. I started commenting on other people's uh, articles um, and then started writing, if you like, longer responses or comments. And eventually I wrote my first blog or two um, and they start, you know, I found my own, own style of writing. Um, I think, you know, have you have you contributed or have you written and published an article? Quite a few, you know, quite a most, quite a few people have there contributed to a book in some form. Again, you know, in the early days, I contributed to quite a few books out there. Now, and I think this is the first thing I would say. There are, there are two types of books out there. There are there are book books, real honest published books, and there are a lot of books out there. And I've just actually, you'll see one's being promoted right now, where I have contributed as a name to a book that's put together that is clearly a promotional vehicle for a software provider, etc. But they ask authors, and Rick, I'm sure you've had this as oh, well, yeah. where you're asked to comp contribute something. It's a win-win. We get a bit of profile, we get our voice out there, our image out there, and of course they get all the social promotion that goes on. A lot of you clearly have an idea for a book, and that's fantastic. You know, uh, over you know over two thirds of you, maybe three quarters of you, actually have an idea for a book. Um, have you written a book but not let, yet published it? A few of you have. Um, none of you has, appear to have secured a contract to write. Small number of you have written and self-published. Some of you have written a book um, that has been published through a publishing company. That's a small amount. Um, nothing is yet um, kind of looking for for inspiration a few of you and there were a few other comments around writing theses and other 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 documents so it was just nice to know that there is you know that there is kind of like the platform of the audience is, is not zero writing um, but you are looking obviously hopefully to get to the kind of next level a scary statistic this is already out of date I ran this on worldometers this morning 
Um, and in this year, 2.2, 2.3 million books have been published. That's the reality out there. It's absolutely huge. Um, I don't know if it's still true. I know that the publishing company I first worked with, um, they told me that uh, out of all the books published, less than 1% sell more than 1,000 copies. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a staggering world out there. Now, some books are written for very small audiences. They're high-end, detailed, technical, scientific, or whatever. But just so you know what's going on out there, um, and this figure has, has definitely accelerated on the grounds that there's, there's such an ease now to go into um, self-publishing. We'll talk about that. Uh, this is not to put you off, but this is to reinforce the important message. You need to find something that's unique about what you have to say, and you've got to market the hell out of it when, it, when, you, when you do get it off the ground. Um, okay, so that's, that's all the slides I want to share at the moment. Um, let me just shut that down so it's not up there. Okay, I'm going to go back to that. Come back. Stop sharing. All right, brilliant. So what are we going to talk about? What are we going to talk about? Um, the Lazy Project Manager for me, the Lazy Project Manager is, you know, as I said, it was, it's my most successful book out there. It was the platform for all the others. I've just submitted my 20th manuscript to a publisher right now waiting for that to emerge from the uh, the factory, as it were. Um, I know it's going to be pretty slow in these current situations because they've got a backlog as well. Um, and I was, you know, I was just very lucky. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to talk about that journey for, for you to begin with. And then, Rick, I'm going to hand over to you to talk about your kind of first experience. In. So, you know, my, what drove me to write The Lazy Project Manager was, was actually I wanted to do Speaking, I want to do public speaking presentations. That's what excited me, um, still does. And I was advised um, by, by uh, someone who was in that, you know, I was talking to a number of like uh, agencies around representation of speaking. Um, and their advice, pretty common advice was, well, have you got a book? No, I haven't got a book. Well, you need a book. <laughs> and a, a book is an authority. Um, it's, you know, it has been described as the best business card in the world you know, for some reason. So you can have you can have all of these years. And, and trust me, I've got a lot of years of experience out there. It, if you have a book, it's almost instantly worth everything that you've done beforehand. It's just it just seems to be. I mean, if you think about Lazy Project Manager, it's 30,000 words. It's not the biggest book on the planet. It's uh, short, fun, etc. And was, was, was just different. But I was lucky. I, I secured a deal with a publishing company. Um, and it was it was just one of those moments of of opportunistic timing, etc. They were an, they were a publishing organisation. The guys are set up on their own. They'd sold out already. One publishing company. They set up a new publishing company. It was in Oxford, England. So I got very sophisticated and intelligent when I went to their uh, lovely <laughs> offices. I all, almost intellectual is great. I love working there. Um, and what they 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 decide they like my book purely because they've decided to publish business books they've gone for like social personal books beforehand they realized they've been business book publishers in the past they realized there was there was a market money to be made so they just came up with a long list of business titles of which project management was one of which at the point in time my suggestion for a book landed on their desk through someone nice kind person who had forwarded it onto them an agent who didn't want to represent me but introduced me um, and they just like, like the title. The advantage for me was they had no idea what project management was. Um, and in fact, they let me write the book exactly how I wrote the book. There was almost no editing involved in that. Um, it was a shock when I, when my second book I published with another publishing company and they went through a rigorous editing process, which really was painful. Um, I wasn't expecting that, but the deal I did with that, with that first, uh, company which I kind of appreciate. Um, I would probably have negotiated a better deal now because I know so much, so much more, but it was known as a shared risk model. So I agreed to buy a whole bunch of books at a price. Uh, they agreed to publish the book and market the book for me, but they were already self-protecting their investment in, in the book by the number of books. Now, what happened was I wrote the book very quickly. It got, uh, you know, ed yeah, did all the good things of you know, being edited and all that, yeah, typeset, all that kind of stuff lovely to cover design, etc. love the images they did. And lo and behold, um, not long after that, 
uh, the postman arrived with six copies of the book, which I was very excited. I was now a published author. Uh, and then a week later, um, this van turned up with boxes and boxes of the books that I'd agreed to buy. Now, what that actually did for me, which, which was incredibly good, was it, it made me get off my ass and get out there and start promoting it. I started speaking everywhere I could, in the UK only to start with. I started selling the books online. I started speaking online. I was determined. And within actually six months, I'd, I'd sold all the books and got all my money back and a little bit of profit, etc. In fact, I bought, I bought some more books as a result. So that's the kind of first model that you, you can be aware of. You know, it's a publishing house that publishes a book for you, but they offset their risk and cost of publishing by, by allowing, you, <laughs> allowing you to buy a number of copies of the book. It's a kind of a shared risk deal. So that was my first publishing experience. I don't regret it. Um, you know, there's no doubt I would have negotiated a better deal now based on my experience in, in that. But, you know, how that's true of everybody. I mean, you hear that all the time in the publishing world, in the in the music world, etc. You know, the naivety to begin with leads you into it. But it launched it. It launched everything else I've done. It's it launched my career for the last 11 years. And, you know, um, I've done over 400 presentations in 25 countries. And it's been it's been amazing. So, you know, that's my first experience. Rick, what, what was your first experience? Yeah, so very similar. I was inspired to speak, um, and as, as a matter of fact, I was inspired by by Neil Witten, but in in a different way. I love Neil; he's a friend and mentor now. But uh, I was the vice president of programs at PMI Birmingham. I knew what we were paying per book, and I knew what we were paying per person for him to come in. And I sat through his no nonsense guide to, to project management and it was all do it because I said so. It was all just, you know, and I was like, Neil, what was your last title? And he's like, well, I was a senior manager at IBM. And I was like, okay, well, I'm this punk kid that's got no authority. How do I get people to follow project management principles? So I felt like I had something to share. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and so I went and bought a book called Putting Your Passion Into Print. And uh, it's no longer in print, but I still have my, my tattered copy and I followed the process. So first thing it said was to write a proposal and we'll get into that in a little bit as to what they're really doing. But the key in the shared risk model, as well as any publishing model is to get a book sold. It has very little to do about the book. What it has to do with is how are you going to market it? How are you going to sell it? How are you going to get out there and, and get it done? Most people think, you know, you write a book and, and they do all the promotion. They, they I, I sold, and Peter's probably the same with you, but 85% of the copies of Project Management That Works that sold, I sold. I sold at various events, at speaking events, through, you know, selling through corporate deals, that kind of stuff. You know, you get some traction on the shelves. But for me, uh, my last name being Morris, uh, when you go into a business section, there's this guy, in fact, he's he's a mentor of mine now uh, named John Maxwell. And he's got, you know, 15 shelves of books and I've, I've got the bottom right corner <laughs> and there's like one copy of my book. So you got to get out there and, and promote. So I, I, I got this uh, putting your passion into print. And the first thing he said was to go get a book agent. And so I found a website called absoluteright.com and it's still out there. It's absoluteright, W-R-I-T-E.com. And this was for authors to share experiences of agents. You know, did they read your copy? Did they turn you down? Was there a reading fee? So number one tip, if an agent ever charges you a reading fee, they're not a real agent. Agents do not charge reading fees. So uh, this was an alphabetical list of of agents that had actually sold books for publishers. I started with zero um, and my agent was Talcott Notch. So I'd gotten turned down all the way through the T's. And the only reason why she took a chance on my book was because her husband was also a project manager for GE. And since I had GE on my resume and I was a project manager, she took a shot at me. So we start to get project management that works uh, for two years. We got turned down she got offered um, a, a what's called a rewrite. Um, and so the Everything Project Management book, which was published by Adams Media, already had an edition out there. They offered me a one-time fee to rewrite the book into a second edition. But the key was, is I would get the byline, right? So I get a one-time fee, no royalties. The moment we signed that deal, um, I now was a published author even though I hadn't started on working on the book and I got into a bidding war for project management that works. So that was my experience. Um, project management that works was devastatingly hard to get through because I felt like a lot of the material that I was saying was, was new to the market and it was, it was more relationship based. It was more people based. And um, I got into all kinds of fights with the editors. 
Uh, so for instance, I, I do a lot of conversation in project management that works. So it's really important that I want you to know that you're talking to a sponsor or to a stakeholder or to a, a department manager. I think that's the most important part. They wanted to name the people. And I'm like, look, some of these conversations go on for two or three pages. And if it's, you know, Peter and Rick, you forget who Peter is, you forget who Rick is. So we had a compromise that they could name the project manager, but then the other uh, title would stay it's just fights like that. Um, they wanted to change the name of the book and they did six times. And right before the book was to, to, to get to the finalized design, I'm, I'm meeting with the marketing team and they're like, we need something snappy or something that kind of says what this book is about. Um, like project management is, um, cor is correct. And I said, how about project management that works? And they're like, oh, brilliant. Yeah, no, that's exactly the title we want for the book. And I was like, that's what I pitched. <laughs> so we went through, you know, hours and hours and hours of meetings to come back to what it is that I pitched. So there is a lot of that give and take when you work with a publisher, right? So, um, my deal was I got an upfront amount to start the book, a different amount when the book was completed and accepted, and then a royalty from there. So for the first year, I didn't really see a royalty check, but lo and behold, it's 12 years later and I got a royalty check yesterday still. So it, it's still making money. It's still selling. We're in our second print. Um, and that was, you know, my most successful book out of them all. In fact, uh, over back here, one of my favorites is my Lithuanian rights copy. So uh, it got, yeah, it, it got translated into Lithuania. Evidently, I'm, I've never been, but evidently I'm huge in Lithuania. <laughs> and so th this is project management that works uh, in Lithuanian. That's impressive. So Lazy Project Management was translated into German. And I was really surprised that Germany is a big pub, is a big market. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> really? And that was translated. I've been translated into Italian, Portuguese, um, my, my favorite one was um, my one of my other books, The Lazy Winner, with the publisher company said, "Well, well, it's been we've sold the rights to Malaysia. It's going to be a, there's going to be a translation." And the only thing that they changed, I mean, they, they changed the layout and everything else, the fonts and everything like that. But the only thing that actually changed was the cover. They took me off the cover, and they put like this little little, uh, little cartoon thing on there instead. Sorry, <laughs> that's translating into Malaysian. There we go. Um, so let's talk about okay. Let's talk about um, self-publishing because, though you know, I wrote later project manager. I immediately, and as you said, Rick, you know, once you're a published author, life is, is so much easier. It's not not dead easy, but it's easier. Um, I was approached by another publishing company about writing another book, and my challenge was I just had to I had to relearn the house style. So I, I was given so much freedom, read freedom with the first book. But when I wrote this second book, I tried to write it, write it as the lazy project manager tool almost for, for the world of PMOs. And it didn't work. We had a lot of problems with uh, you know, discussions and challenges, et cetera. And, um, and, and I found that kind of editing process quite brutal. But actually, I, I recognize it produced a good book. Um, and actually, when I wrote the second and the third book for the same publishing company, I found it very easy because I knew what they wanted. But after that was my first foray into self-publishing uh, because it, I just wanted to write something that gave me a, a bit of relief. The reason was I'd, I'd just written a book with three, with two, two other people, which I'm never going to do again. Because it's, it's, it's a terrible number to write a book with, I believe, on the grounds that, um, you know, just trying to get two people to agree on something was just just, just challenging. And, and I spent more time doing that than writing, actually. But I wanted a bit of release and I, I found the whole, you know, the Amazon platform, et cetera. And, uh, you know, I found it very easy. I mean, Rick, with, you know, what's your experience? Yeah. You've self-published. Yeah. Yeah. The Amazon. So I, uh, I went through a second publisher. Let me, let me just speak on that for just a second. Cause sure. it was interesting. Um, and, and this is no shame on the company at all, but I think it's important to know who the company was. The, my, my second publisher was RMC Project Management. They uh, approached me at a PMI conference and wanted me to write a second book. And I said, you know, I've got this book, Stop Playing Games. What was really interesting is the only other book that they had ever edited was Rita's uh, Rita Mulcahy's PMP exam prep. And Rita had a lot of things in that to prepare you for the PMP exam prep that wasn't the real world. Hopefully you guys have had that experience, right? When you went to go take your, your PMP test, you're like, you're, you're having to relearn project management because that's not how it operates in the real world. And I had built this book as the bridge between the PMI exam and the real world. This is, this is how you stop playing games. So for instance, um, one of the games that I talk about is when uh, we try to outpad the cut. 
of, of sponsors, right? So when we have a, a budget of 250,000, the first thing we do is say, okay, it's $300,000, knowing that our sponsor is going to, you know, lump some 10% cut off of that. And so our goal is to really try to outpad the cut, which is a game. And it's one that's, that starts the relationship off with a lie. Right. And so, um, when you submit that to the people who are responsible for, for adhering to the PMBOK, the, the poor editor they assigned to me, she and I just butted heads. You can't say this. You can't do this. That's not the way it works. Rita says this. And I'm like, look, this is my book. I'm telling you, this is the way it's going to go. And so twice I, I went to fire up and said, all right, th then we're just not going to work together because this book is, is, is going to be this way. And finally, they gave me an editor uh, that uh, had been a project manager in the real world. And we got through it and, and it turned out to be a really good book. But that, that experience was crazy because they were telling me this isn't how project management is. I was like, I can tell you the client and the project <laughs> where I said this. <laughs> so it was an interesting, uh, interesting run. So, yeah. Okay. Brilliant. But um, yeah, so coming back to self-publishing after that. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. How did that get work? So, so that, the, yeah. So the next book, I just wanted to take control. When you, when you start to look at, you know, even though you get an advance, which sounds great, it's an advance that can sell sold copies. Um, I think the real difference for me between self-publishing and, and, publishing itself is again, 85% of the books that are sold, I sell. So it comes down to what am I paying per copy on that book? So for project management that works is $24.95 is the cover price. I have to pay $14 to Amicom for my own book, right? And when you go self-publishing, it's like $3.95 all said and done, I don't have to, to pre-purchase copies. They, they print on demand. They automatically put it on Amazon for you. So you don't have the, uh, the, the bus showing up, Peter, of all of your books and boxes. And you go, uh-oh, <laughs> now what do I have to do? Um, and so to me, that model is super easy. Um, I do make an investment. I have a, an editor now that charges me between three and five grand to go through the editing of the book. I have a typesetter that charges me about a grand to do the typesetting. So I go about five to $6,000 in, but that's no different than that shared risk model. Um, I go about five to six grand in to, to getting the book published, but then immediately, you know, if it's a 1995 cover price, I'm paying three nineteen, three twenty, Um, and so I'm recouping it back on the other side of the sales. Cool. So it's really economics. Yeah, I struck a deal actually with the publishers of Lazy Project Manager. So when I self-publish, they offer me a package of actually where they will do all the editing, typesetting, etc., cover design for me. It's a you know we had a really good deal because I, I I guilted them into the fact that they gave me a you know tough deal to begin with, and they owe good me. for you. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've used them, and look, I mean the book that was produced very recently, and I know it's a rough and ready book, but the Projectless Manager that was that we produced in twenty one days, it's just an example. Uh, and I don't know one of the contributors is on being you know is on the is online engine waving. There you go. Um, yeah, I mean this is you know we, this is this is what's possible now. I'm actually you're producing something and getting it published really really fast. I mean, typically once you submit your manuscript to um, to Amazon the, the you know, KDP platform, once you've gone through the checking process etc. Yeah, they will publish it within about 24 hours, 24 or 48 hours. It's really fast. You set the price within their parameters. It appears slowly, you know, probably takes about a week to appear on all the Amazon platforms around the world, et cetera. You can then produce um, a Kindle version and put it up there. It is super easy. Once you, you know, it's all like all things. Once you've done it once, it's super easy. The, the advantage, everything Rick said, you know, you're, you're in control. You can, you know, you're making, you know, you're going to make more money on the books, et cetera. They, they are cheap to buy, particularly if you're selling them at conferences. It's brilliant. Um, the, the, you know, the, the downside is, is that it's only you marketing it and nobody else is marketing it out there. It's in that mass of, of books out there. So I've enjoyed both. I've enjoyed, you know, I still continue. Um, you know, my latest book is, is through a publishing house, currently working with Routledge. Um, but, you know, I, you know, I enjoy the kind of self-publishing as well. It, it, for me, it's almost a, has two major advantages. One, it's it's a kind of de-stress when I'm writing. I can, you know I can knock off a it sounds terrible like you knock off a, another lazy project manager book or something I want to write about relatively easy. Um, I can get it published, and and the big advantage I think Rick is that, and I've been doing it recently. You know by owning it, I can give it away if I want to. So when I'm, yep. when I'm engaging with organisations and and we we get to that point of well you know procurement would like to talk to you about the fee for speaking at our conference. 
well, I don't want to speak about the fee because that is my fee, but listen, how about if I slip an ebook for all of yep. your attendees? They love it because they value it. They value it that uh, the at uh, the ten bucks or wherever it is you charge for the for the ebook. Um, yep. But actually, it costs you absolutely nothing. So I, for me, that's the, probably the biggest advantage. Yeah. In it, 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 so there, there's a couple of tricks in publishing. Let, let, let's 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 peel the onion, Peter. Let's. Let, let, let's really share some insight and right. uh, give some. So, uh, and only a few people are on camera, but is it impressive when, when you hear somebody's a number one Amazon bestseller? I mean, it's like when you say, hey, here's an Amazon bestselling book, number one. At, well, w- what's interesting about that is it's. Here, it's, goes our image. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, it's not even that. No, but what's interesting about that is it, it's about numbers sold and, there, and there's ways that, that people go about that. What about a New York Times bestseller, right? New York Times bestsellers there. Um, what's interesting about New York Times bestseller is anything that you pre-sell counts as your sales of the first week. So if you're really strategic as the project managers are, um, then there's ways in which you can sell the book or give the book away prior to the release date so that all 7,500 copies count towards week one and you become a New York Times bestseller. And it is what it is, right? That, it, it, that's, and quite frankly, those little tricks are necessary Maxwell pumps out a book and 4 million copies are pre-sold. It's, it's crazy. Um, but what I learned more than anything, Peter, is, is to me, for me personally, you have to speak in order to really market the book. I went to Houston for a three-day conference. They gave me a table. I had all my books out there. I take 10% of the audience of books, right? I think you, you do something similar. I think you're like at 20%, right, Peter? So if you got 100 people, you're bringing 20 books generally, something of that sort. Um, so I'd done all the math. I have all my books there. And for two and a half days, I sold one book and then I did the lunch keynote and then I sold out of books right after the lunch. There there was like a line at my table and I sold out. Nobody cares about the book until they know who you are and heard you speak and go, Oh my God, Peter, Peter's funny, man. I bet you this book is going to be great. You know, that's really the key to me is if people put out books to think that they're going to make money, the book doesn't really ever generate that much money. What it does generate is the speaking fees and the sales of the back of the room after the speaking fees. Is that fair, Peter? Yeah, absolutely fair. I mean, you know, I, I, I'll be honest, I hate being closing keynote speaker because exactly what Rick said. You know, you, 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 yep. yeah, as soon as you, if, you, if you're closing keynote, people don't want to stay around. Um, and I've, I've seen it, you know, when, when you, if you can, if you, if you can get a slot, where it's straight, there's a break straight afterwards. You will sell a whole bunch of books because it's just in the moment. People just want a souvenir. They want to, you know, they've been inspired, they've been entertained, and they don't mind shelling out 10, 20 bucks for it, maybe, um, for a book, uh, especially if they can get you to sign it. It's amazing. Um, oh, they're, they're emotionally connected yeah, to yeah. you. Yeah. If, you, if there's a delay, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're like opening keynote and it's not until the coffee break that you can sell the books, it goes down a little bit. People come to their senses, they've heard someone else. Uh, and as you say, you know, if if, if you're the if you're the guy at the end of the day, then you, you're carrying those books home mostly, uh, unless you yeah. can resell them. Yeah. And That's another right. tip about this, I learned this. I was at, uh, in the early days. I was, uh, you know, had all these lazy project management books. I was invited to speak at uh, the big conference in the UK at the time, which was I think it was pre Synergy, it's known as now in the UK, but it was the it was the PMI event, and it was it was held at uh, GSK obviously that year, and they allow me that the uh, the President of PMI UK was was yeah a bit of a fan, and he allowed me. He squeezed me into the agenda. And he gave me fifteen minutes on stage, which I not the I just one of my best. You know, I just I just hit them with all the exciting stuff about yeah. lazy project manager, and I had all these books, and I went out, and it was just mayhem. Except do not ever 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 sell something for like I did it for eight pound. I think <laughs> now eight pound requires change. Nobody had to. I mean, yeah. I, we don't use cash these days, do we? But oh <laughs> my God, at the end of this, I was like running around, people owe me money, I owe people money, etc. When I finished, I sold 96 books that day, which for me was a phenomenal amount. And I had money coming out of my pockets all over the place. And I remember I stopped at McDonald's yeah. on the way home and I, you know, I just bought a burger and I was starving and I put my hand in and all these notes came out and the guy just looked at me like, what, what are you? You know, <laughs> some kind of drug. <laughs> so, you know, always, Go for round figures and pre-sell if you possibly can. Absolutely. I was in uh, Canada and uh, I, I was a keynote with Kevin Iguano and, and Kevin Iguano just had a book come out and we're, we're side by side at the table and we have equal lines, but 
um, at the time, I just had the shunk shunk you know, for the credit cards, right? So I thought I was sophisticated. I had a little credit card thing. I could take it. They could sign it. I'd have to go back and enter in all the information to, to, to make the sales. And he was sitting there with just a card swipe machine. And, and it was just in the early days when you could do that on your phone. It was like brand new. And he's selling like six books to one. <laughs> I was like, all right, I got to step up my game. So th those little things are really important that you, that you learn. The cash side of it, the... Um, the taking credit cards and, and being prepared to take credit cards because people, a lot of people don't carry cash um, and making it super easy at that point of sale for them. Yeah. Yeah. So let's move on. So we talked about, you know, the kind of publishing uh, experiences we've had. Let's move on to um, the, you know, what the book submission itself. So, you know, I think, you know, every publisher, I mean, I, I started out because, you know, I had this this book, which is the writer's yearbook, which had all the uh, all of the literary agents in it and all the publishing houses, et cetera. It talks about, um, you know, what the publishing houses do and don't publish, what they're looking for. You can go on their websites, you can see if they're taking submissions or not. But, well, you know, I found that, um, you know, they, they pretty much all of them have some form of template that you need to, to fill in. I think, Rick, you touched on it earlier on as much as it's about the book, they want you to, um, I mean, typically I've just, you know, I've recently done one. I'm waiting for a couple of responses on that. On a couple of ideas right now, but you know, they want a, they want a good catchy book title and subtitle and they want a, an abstract of what the book's about. They want to understand you know, broadly what the, what the structure of the books can, is going to be. Um, and, and, you know, this is, you're in sales mode. I mean, pretty much every book I've written has not ended up like the submission I put in, you know, you start writing right. and things change. Um, but then you get on to, they want to know about what, what are the other books in the marketplace? What's different about your book? What's the USP? How are you going to market? How are you going to socialize it? Is there any events or conferences or communities that you're part of that would like to buy copies of the book in advance? All of that, it forms as much as a submission as possible. And Rick, I'm guessing that's just the same for you. Yeah, the, the number one piece of advice I give is don't write the book. Um, what you do is, it, it, yeah, you write the abstract, the table of contents, you have to submit one or two chapters. And really the only thing they're, they're looking at your writing style to see how much editing are they going to have to do in those one to two chapters. And they're also looking for the average length of the one to two chapters to determine the word count uh, of the book itself. But you don't write the full book. You write a table of contents, some bullet points, uh, a little bit of an abstract of each chapter, why it's different. Um, but the marketing thing was key. And so one of the, the tips I give people, and it's something I started when I first started professionally speaking, is I have a spreadsheet of every speech I've ever given, where I gave it, and approximately how many people were there. So that now when I'm doing book submissions, I can say I've, I've been on stage in front of over a million people. I've got over 2 million listens and podcasts. So mere shouting out the book is going to get it to 3 million people, right? Um, those types of numbers is what they're looking for. How are you going to sell the book? How are you going to market the book? How are you going to get it out there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I think you know, as part of that, it is important that you kind of do your research. And it's, it's interesting. I've been recently, I've, I've been uh, engaged quite a few times to, um, assess other people's submissions for, for another publishing company. And it's really interesting because, you know, some people you can see they've really done their homework and other people like, well, there's no other book out there like this. Well, I've just found one within 30 seconds of looking at yeah. Amazon or whatever. You're not doing yourself any favor. So do the research definitely um, to make sure that, that, that that's there. Um, I mean, as I said, don't get overly hung up on the, the what the book's going to look like at the end, because once you've got a contract to write it, you can write it within us, you know, quite a lot of freedom, actually. Um, you know, um, I've, I've pretty much always made deadlines and stuff on books, but you know, again, they, these companies, publishing companies are pretty relaxed and they have a, they have this process. And when, as soon as a book is submitted and they like it, uh, they, they, it ticks the boxes, they put it into their production pipeline. And it typically, I mean, a big publisher, it typically seems to take about six months for something to come through and, appear at the other end etc so again don't get don't get over hung up but really do your homework on how it is that you're going to help sell the book and that what else is out there and what does make your book really really different you saw the numbers of book number of books published i, I couldn't find out how many business books were part of that but it's a big number obviously yeah i'm doing research so i've got a <clears throat> a new submission that i'm doing right now and, and i'll share it it's it's um, for five years, I've done a, a radio show every Friday and, and I have entrepreneurs and project managers and business leaders come in and I ask a question at the end every time, which is what is some of the best advice you've ever received? And I did that with the intention of going back 
and finding my favorites and being able to tell their story. And what I'm finding is that most of the advice that has been given is literally comes from their parents, their grandparents, you know, family members, whereas almost everything that's on the shelf about advice is from these prominent, you know, the Simon Senex and the Seth Godins and these prominent people. And I, I, I feel like the difference in this book is this is, this is true passed along advice that is different. So that research side of it, I came up with 11 books that, that offer advice and pinpointed how this is going to be different. It's not a single voice. It's different. Right? And so that's, that was the key to, to get this, this moving into the next direction. Cool. And yeah, I'm going to reiterate. I mean, I, yeah, I remember a gentleman came up to me after a conference uh, somewhere in Europe. I can't remember where, but now, but he came up and he said, "I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it's actually at this conference, two people talked to me. One person said, I'm having struggling with with writing a book. I, I've sold the idea. I've got the, you know, the concepts around it. I've got, you know, I've got the contracts. I can't get going." And he just delivered what I thought was a, you know, a pretty good um, presentation. And I, my advice to him said, "Well." Next time you do that presentation, record it, get it transcribed, because there's there's your first 5,000 words of your book. And that really got him going. The second gentleman came up and said, um, I'm writing this book. And he told me what it was all about. I said, OK. And he, I, I was expecting the, well, I'm really struggling. And he, and he goes, I don't know. He says, I've got a quarter of a million books, a quarter, quarter of a million words so far. And I don't know quite where to go with this. And he's like, Stop. You know, I think at that point I'd written five books and um, has anybody I probably had 120,000 well, words. I'm sure I've even written a couple of million books in my life, a couple of million words in my life. And so and you're like, stop, you know, carve something out, take it to your publisher, get the editors working on it. There's, there, if there's a book in there somewhere, you've just got to stop. So really don't, don't, don't write, don't write everything until you yeah. know where you're going with it. I mean, if you're self-publishing, that's fine, but if you're, if you're trying to go to a publishing house, they, they will want to take it in a certain direction. And, and you know, you've got to be, give yourself that flexibility. So Rick, why don't we, um, why don't we stop at that point? Um, we can come back and chat a little bit more, but let's, let's, let's open it up because obviously the, you know, the forum is out there um, for everybody on this call to, to ask the questions of us. And uh, we're, we're happy to do that. Or any, any words of wisdom, if there's any, um, any, any um, you know, rich and famous authors out there, um, looking at you, Rob, then, um, you know, any advice for other people. <laughs> and if uh, you're not on camera, you can type in the chat as well. Yeah, we can grab the... So, yeah, go on. This is your chance. Hello. Hello. Hey, Claude. Yeah. Hi. How are you guys? All this right. This is how are you, uh, really interesting. Uh, I thought I was going to hire you to write the book that I'm trying to write, but... Maybe I cannot afford you guys. <laughs> oh, we, didn't, uh, no. we didn't think about that ghostwriting. We didn't think about yeah. that. <laughs> no, but uh, I think I'm thinking about the comment you guys made about this this uh, John Maxwell or someone having like 15 shelves full of project management books. So there's been a lot of project management books written over the years. And how as a, someone who actually is planning to write a book, how do you make sure that somehow you're not infringing into intellectual property or something that may have already been written? Because, um, I mean, I guess I could go online and check, okay, uh, did anyone ever write a book or, around this topic and things like that, but someone it's, it's not fresh in your mind and, and you don't know really what, uh, what you're doing, right? And you don't want to end up being sued yeah. because Someone's going to yeah, say but you plagiarize as long as you're not plagiarizing a direct book. But let me no. let me talk about John for a second. Um, so John Maxwell writes on leadership. He's a, he's he's written 127 books now, um, and and he's a mentor of mine now. And I've asked him several questions about it. And so I'll give you the advice he he said. So first of all, he says, Rick, I I firmly believe that every word has already been said, every book has already been written, and every speech has already been made. The difference is is you haven't made it meaning your unique take, your personal experience, your stories, your clients, the way that you came into the profession, all of those things are what makes you unique. You know, project management is project management. Yes, there's millions of books. So why was Lazy Project Manager successful or why was project management that works successful is it came from, first of all, our personal hearts and our personal stories. And it was what we saw on the market that we thought was going to be a little bit different. Um, some of the, like I talk about PERT methodology in, in 
project management that works. There's tons of books out there on PERT methodology. Um, but what I do is I have a conversation with sponsors that utilizes the PERT methodology within the conversation. So that was that unique difference that, that I could do. The, the biggest thing that you have to answer when you decide to write a book is who's going to read the book. And that sounds awful. Like who's going to read this? But the point is, is you're writing it for somebody else who doesn't have your experience, who hasn't lived your life, so that you can give them a piece of inspiration or learn a lesson. That's who's going to read the book. It doesn't matter if the words have been said before, as long as you don't just, you know, cut and paste from you know, blog posts or people's books. I don't think you're really at risk for being sued for an idea. Peter? No, I, agree, I agree with that. I think, you know, as long as you've done your research to start with, um, and at the end, I mean, if, you, if you're worried about anything, there's, there's online plagiarism tools that you can use to go and validate stuff. Um, it really excites me these days when I you know, use things like that because it keeps finding me quoting stuff, which is brilliant. You make your, makes your ego feel really good there. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and again, yeah, you, literally, I mean, you know, I, I put dinosaurs into project management, but you know, nothing I talk about in Lazy Project Manager isn't, isn't stuff that had been talked about beforehand it just hadn't been talked about necessarily in, in a in a fun entertaining way and that was kind of the the kind of usb from my point of view etc so yeah yeah hopefully that kind of uh, answers your question oh yeah thank you so much yes okay. it does really help thank you all right next question uh one just came in jan schiller said any advice for creating a book that summarizes blog posts or digital magazine articles um there's actually a really cool app out there right now and i did it as a um as a lead magnet peter there, there's an app uh, called designer with two r's um okay and that'll take a that'll take your blog like my blog i just i just typed in the web address of my blog and it went and pulled all the articles into a book format Okay. And then I was just like, I don't want this one. I don't want this one. And so I created a, uh, a book called Lessons Learned Confessions of a Project Manager. And it was just like 15 or 20 of my favorite blog posts. And it made it look like a book and it was an ebook, right? But it made it, it, you can design a cover and then give it away as a lead magnet. Um, that's the advice I have on that. If you're summarizing other people's blog posts or digital magazine articles, then that you have to just make sure that you get releases for. So the biggest part of my book right now on, on the advice is I have to get releases from everybody that I want to use the stories because they told me that on my podcast, I didn't write it. So I have to reach out to them and they have to sign that it's okay for me to use that quote in their story. Cool. Cool. All right. Next. We're warming up now. Yeah, we are. And I think it's uh, without an E, uh, Jan. I think it's designer with no E. If I remember, I got, I got like a subscription that it was like, when it came out, it was like 40 bucks for lifetime access, but a really cool e-magnet creator, uh, a lead magnet creator. I'm going to touch on one while we're waiting for the next, next question, which is, um, you know, uh, something I went through. So my, my publishers came to me, Lazy Project Manager published, and they said, we, uh, the book's doing well, but we want to really push it and, and really get it off the ground. And he, and he said, well, okay, what are we going to do? And he said, well, we're going to give it away. It's like, uh, what do you mean you're going to give it away? They said, no, we're going to give it away for free. Um, and um, you know, I, I go, well, okay, how does that work with royalties and stuff like that? Go, well, you won't get any. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, and they did. They did they, at the time. There was kind of like a, a kind of a pulse thing you could do on Amazon, which you make it free, you set a price, you make it free, you set a price. There's a little mechanism you went through. I had no idea if they could still do that or not. I know there are things when you self-publish, you can put out there for a free or a, less, you know, a rising price over a period of time. But you know what? It paid off. Another example recently was, you know, at the start of this whole COVID thing, I started doing a whole bunch of free webinars around the project manager who smiled, you know, putting fun back in project management, et cetera. And I was giving the book away as part of those, those events. Uh, the ebook, of course, um, and what what really surprised me was I look at the sales track from from Amazon, and people were buying the book. You know, even though I'm giving it away, people are buying the book. So don't yeah. be afraid to give stuff away. Really, don't be afraid to give stuff away. One of the one of the greatest marketing things I've seen around books and or webinars was, was uh, the, the guy that he's the president of the John Maxwell team. His name's Paul Martinelli. This guy prints money. He, it's amazing the marketing that he does. But what he does, Peter, is he says, you know what, I'm going to do this. Um, I'm going to do this for free. I, I'm going to read the book and I'm going to give all the material away for free. And he announces that he gets people to sign up and he does. But what he does is he only puts the video up uh, for each chapter. 
for like 48 hours and he blitzes it out. So quite all of us are going to be busy and we're going to miss one. Mm -hmm. And then he turns around and says, you know what? I'll give you lifetime access to this and the book for 50 bucks. And people just start just chalking it up, just start spending money. Um, and so he's doing it with integrity. He is giving you away for free. If you're on the spot and you happen to, to be able to catch all the videos, you got all the material for free. But yeah. if you want to go back and reference it, or if you, you know, you want to share it with somebody else or whatever, it's a small licensing fee and, and off you go. It's brilliant though. I've, I've watched him do it. I've watched him do it with a book that's not his. <laughs> Meaning he did, he did it with Think and Grow Rich and he mentored people through the book. And then a hundred dollars to, to go back and see the videos. And he, he, I think it was like 1.4, 1.5 million in sales oh, God. from doing something like that. A hundred bucks a, a clip. It was crazy. Crazy. All right. We have a quick question here, Rick now uh, from Yasser about uh, close to writing his first book. Um, well, he's looking for some advice of it, which is best to start self-publishing or a publisher. What are, you, what are your views? My personal and, and the way I the way I even went about it is I wanted to be a published author first and then make my decisions of where I want to go. Do I want to take on another publisher? Do I want to self-publish this? So it's very it's very hard road, especially if you've never published before. The risk is if you go self-published, now you've got numbers. So meaning they're going to go, well, how many of those books did you sell in the self-publishing? You're like, uh, you know, I got a good 50 out there, right? <laughs> they're, 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 they're going to pass on that. So the fact that you're an unknown author plays in both directions there. But then once you've got that, that stamp, again, um, project management that works, nobody was interested. I write that book for Adams Media, which I just reformatted a book essentially and added two chapters. And I had a bidding war on project management that works because I was now a published author. So I, to me that it's important to go that route. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think if you can get a, if you can get a publishing deal, a traditional publishing deal, it, it just gives you that platform of, of uh, um, you know, reference for the future. It's, you know, I don't know. You're just seen as a serious author, um, you know, I know. I, I, I think it's still a differentiator, right, Peter? Because so many people have self-published now. The yeah. fact that our first books were published by, you know, Minds Amicom and RMC and Adams Media, um, you know, the, the, to be able to put that in your bio, even it, it, yeah. it gives you that step up. I mean, even Fifty Shades of Grey. I know it's self-published to start with, but uh, she said yeah. off to a publisher as soon as she could. So, yeah, that's right. And the rest is history. Um, okay, another question has come in. Uh, have you been asked to be an adjunct instructor in the higher ed sphere? Oh, I, no, I haven't. I have, yeah. Oh, okay, then you, you're probably best to answer it then. Uh, well, so I, yeah, I, I did for UAB, but that um, I was an adjunct professor uh, using my material, my book. So they they bought my book for everybody in class in an exchange. I, you know, okay. locally did that here, um, but I, in, in in transitioning to that, that's a whole different level of books then right so you've got your standard books which is your marketing when you start to get into education books then that's that that's a whole different structure and path to, to write uh textbooks okay all right okay thank you my pleasure what else have we got whilst we're waiting rick question for you i mean um all right i missed it i did it when my first book came out i went and found it in a bookshop and i a bookshelf and I, a bookshop and i made sure it was face out front yep. of all the other books. Yeah. Okay, fine. I and I, and I, well, well, that's, <laughs> that's how I found it. But my, my favorite, my daughter was like six at the time. And so I'm pumped because both books, both books ended up having the same deadline and publishing in the same month, uh, the everything project management book and project management that works. So I had two books on the shelf at, at once. Um, for the first time, I took my daughter to a Barnes and Noble and we went and found my book. And that's where the story comes from the bottom right. And my daughter goes, uh, wow, John Maxwell writes a lot of books. And so I got to share that story with John, uh, you know, many years later, and he, he loved it. But my daughter was so unimpressed that daddy had a book on the shelf because, you know, John had so many uh, above me and that that always haunted me. It, Morris, I mean, Maxwell Morris in the yeah. business section, there's not a lot of books in between us. So. <laughs> what else have we got? I know in the early days I met Dr. Harold Kersner, who's got pretty famous in the world of project management, and uh, we exchanged books. and And, and he gave me this book that was like, you know, he writes books that are you know hundred thousand plus words easily, probably more. 
and I floated the lazy project manager. He, he read it on the plane back, etc. And uh, you know, he liked it. So it's not always about it's not always about quantity. All right. <laughs> Wait, one of my friends, uh, one of my friends I went to high school with, is Wayne Brady. Right, he's a very very big entertainer, and I was just I, I happened to be speaking for CA in Las Vegas, and he had a show there, and so I gave him one of my books, and he goes. <laughs> Huh, project Man- this is exactly what i want to read on the plane home no really no thanks for this book i was just so proud i was like hey buddy look what i'm doing uh he's like yeah i don't care <laughs> so here's an interesting question um so i've been asked to contribute to a book which is a compendium of articles from different authors how would you approach the contractual remuneration discussion when you're a co-contributor i think the the brutal is you don't get anything. I mean, it's, you know, I've, I've done this. I was part of a um, Project Pain Reliever, uh, the Jay Ross book. Um, you know, I contributed a chapter to it. It was basically, I did it for, you know, fame, not fortune, as far as that's concerned. I, I don't know. I've never been in a situation where, where, we, we, where I've actually earned anything from purely contributing a part of a book. Rick, have you? Yeah. Um, so I wrote a chapter for the Agile Almanac around tools and I recommended CA tools and then sold it to CA world where we actually had a book signing and that kind of stuff. And they bought a bunch of books. So I got cut in on that. Okay. Um, I think I'm supposed to get royalties afterwards, but I just, you know, John Stenbeck just never pays me. So I don't know. Like I, I don't follow up on that stuff. I maybe, okay. but I don't think it's, it, it's not a moneymaker unless my name name is prominent on there. Then I'm, once I contribute, I, I feel like I'm giving it away. Well, conversely to that, if you are yeah. the if you are effectively the uh, the producer of the book, you know you do have your name on the front. You're the one that gets the royalty, unless it's that's right. The counter deal, you know. That's right. You could actually have written none of the words in the book if you put it together and your name's on the front. Um, another question, friend. Uh, what came first for you, the idea of the book or desire to write and topic afterwards? For me, it was the desire to to. I've always wanted to write, and I you know I I. I like a lot of people, I tried a few things of, you know, sort of, um, you know, putting, trying to write a book, etc. Never got anywhere. And then, going, you know, as I said beforehand, when I wanted to to get out there and do professional speaking, was told to have a book, etc. It kind of, it all came together for me in the fact that I had this idea for Lazy Project Manager. It would be a nice title for a book, etc. And, and the two things came together. So for me, it was a, it was having, it was, I guess, it was a desire to speak that led into the desire to write, which led into the creation of the book itself. Rick, for you? Exactly the same thing. I think I came up with the idea of the speech first. Uh, I wrote a speech called Making Emotional Conversations Unemotional, which became the basis of the first three chapters of Project Management That Works. And then I had to fill 65,000 words. So I started to dig through <laughs> my archives to find what other tips and tricks I could find really quickly. But yeah, I think it was it was the desire to write for, and speak. And then the topics came to me. Okay. Okay. Which reminds just trigger a reminder. We've got one more question, which, um, you know, maybe Nick, Rick, you can have a quick look at that while I'm talking. The, yeah. Uh, um, it, some of the marketing things, I and mean, just, you know, I, I wrote the Lazy Project Manager. I, I managed to get a slot at the PMI um, European conference. Um, I was terrified of nobody turning up to my session. And so, in a moment of um, sort of inspiration, I came up with these badges that said, I am a Lazy Project Manager. I started going around this conference, giving them to everybody, leave them on the coffee tables, et cetera. Um, and I, I probably breached PMI rules, who knows, but, uh, um, you know, I was delighted. I actually had standing room only in the, uh, in the presentation and I was given an encore session as well. And the next year I gave a different badge away. The third year I didn't go to the conference and I had people contact me saying, where are you? We want our new badge or pin. <laughs> so, uh, simple yeah. marketing things can really work. So what about the language there, Rick? What were you thinking about that? I, you know, I don't, I mean, English is, is the biggest market in terms of it's, it's the most widely, you know, one of the most widely spoken, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, again, I think we've, we've got, you know, my books are, have been translated. Your books have been translated, Peter. I think it's best to write in your native market and your native language and sell mm-hmm. locally. And then the demand will drive the translations into the, into the other formats. I, I, I don't think I have enough information to answer that question. Yeah. I, I, mean, my, I don't know. I've, you know, I've seen both. I think, you know, gen, I mean, English is, is, is the business language of, of the world, but I mean, you know, if you're, if you're in China and you write a book, you can still sell a million copies of the book in, in, in Mandarin or right. whatever. So I think you have to take a call on, on that. Um, you know, I think the, uh, just a warning there. Uh, one of the other things I've had is a lot of people will get very excited about books and they want to translate stuff for you. 
And you really got to watch that because, you know, whilst people can translate, they're not professional translators. You've got to be very, very careful around that. Uh, it reminds me, I don't know, Rick, where you have picked this up in America, but Amazon just launched in Sweden. And they've, you, they're not quite sure what they've done, but the translations are causing a lot of humor. Um, apart from the fact they managed to use the Argentinian flag instead of the Swedish flag by mistake, fundamental error. <laughs> But Whoops. some of the translations are somewhat rude that's coming through for some of the items, etc. So that's a lot of fun about the risk of, of bad translations or auto translations, even in this modern world. Yeah, I think the other thing to remember, too, is that once you put the book out, it's public domain. Um, and so, uh, like I said, I, I got translated into Lithuanian, but I, I found this YouTube video of a lady who was teaching a seminar off of my book in oh, Lithuania. Yeah. And I reached out to her and she was scared. And I was like, look, I don't, I'm not planning any trips to Lithuania. If you're making money and that's working for you, you know, just make sure that there's a copy of the book for each one of them. And you know, I'm golden. Um, but it's, it's interesting to see, um, because I trademarked project management that works and I started to see classes like project management that works for accountants come out, you know, and things like that. You get, you kind of have to watch the intellectual property a little bit there, but uh, uh, you've got to have an abundance mindset in, yeah. in, when you, when you write something and put something out there, that abundance mindset says, yeah, there are some people that are going to take it, do things with it. And, and you can't control that. You put it out into the world and you've got to be okay with that, but be prepared to, to watch your IP and, in um, watch what happens to it. To me, I was inspired that, that she built a practice around my book. I was like, I just want to meet you. <laughs> I did. There was uh, a, a gentleman uh, that was in Iran, actually. But there was, uh, you know, I, I came, it just came up. I found it, it was, um, you yeah, know, teaching you to be a lazy project manager, basically. So I, I registered for the course and uh, never heard anything back after that. So here we go. <laughs> Real quick, uh, we got two minutes to go. Um, yeah. Nigel, uh, just what marketing activities do you think have been most effective to you? And have any of your books been converted to audio? Do you read them yourself for famous actors? I read mine myself, Stop Playing Games, the, the, the audio book. Project Management That Works was never made into an audio book. Um, and marketing to me has been speaking. Peter? Yeah, I agree. I, I agree with that. And I'm just going to share a couple of slides to, uh, to finish things off. But yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, the best is speaking. Absolutely. Most of my work comes from speaking. Most of the interest that comes from speaking. But, you know, I've done like Rick has done. I've done, you know, I've done a lot of LinkedIn activity, a lot of Twitter. I've done a lot. I've done podcasts, etc. Um, I, you know, I just tried anything uh, really to get all those books out of my garage to start with. So, you know, just go for it. Um, I asked a couple of authors out there just to kind of just talk about a little bit. Uh, There's a friend of uh, Rick's and mine, Elizabeth Harron. Um, and I, you know, I asked them for sort of one comment, uh, one piece of advice. And Elizabeth is, you know, she knew how long my, my book needs to be and set yourself targets for word count so she could track. I do the same thing. I put up a little I do too. on the wall and I just yeah. think, I'm going to do 3,000 words a day. I don't always do it, but I, it keeps me on, on that. So it really, uh, that's uh, good advice from Elizabeth. It does keep you on track when you're writing. Um, Brett Harney's uh, written a book. Uh, he's the guy from Digital Project Management. Uh, and he's at least, you know, he's, you know, it's, it's about, it, it's not simple writing a book on project management because, you know, you could could argue, and excited though we might be, you know, it's kind of sometimes often boring. So, you know, don't be afraid to use your unique voice. Rick, I think you said that and your experiences in your work, because that's what will connect you. Absolutely. Again, in my book, Lazy Project Manager, I think it was the honest stories, the case studies where I screwed things up that people found some sort of connection to. And Rick, you said exactly the same thing. Yeah. And the last one, this is the guy, um, uh, Gary Nelson. He, he's written the whole series. I've just, I just reviewed his sixth book in this series of the Ultimate Treehouse Project. It was the first book. It's the Project Kids Adventure. And it's, it's, it's books for children to teach them about project management. And they are just brilliant. Wow. And you can see, look, he's been translated in English, Japanese, Portuguese, Spanish. The problem with the original idea is that they don't tend to fit the mainstream thinking. And I know he had a lot of struggles when he first came out with this idea of the Ultimate Treehouse Project. Um, and if you've got an idea and a passion for getting it out there, making a difference, just do it, write it, publish it yourself, so you yeah. can make it happen. And that's kind of what he's done. And he's been very successful that route. I know we said about the authority of a publishing house, et cetera, but he's just been mind driven on this one. Um, and the great thing about the, the Ultimate Treehouse is my youngest son reviewed it as well, because he was the right age. And, he, and, he, and when he gave me the review back, because he liked the book, but he bought him, he said, son of the lazy project manager. And I was so proud oh. of that. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, there we go. So some, some advice from, from some actual publishers out there. Uh, we've done the Q&A. 
look, that's uh, that's it. That's all our stuff. We're we're out. <laughs> um, Nigel, my my going back to Nigel real quick. My number one salesperson was my seven year old daughter, <laughs> and she used to sit at the table with the ringlet curls, and she'd go, "Do you want my daddy to sign this book?" And phew, they just they fly off the shelf. <laughs> yeah. So if you can use use your kids, it works. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I had a gentleman I, in the early days. I got so excited because I everyone bought a book. They want me to sign this guy. Said, Could you not sign the book, please? I'm like, okay. He says, "No, I, I like to read books and then resell them." Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fine, fine. Um, look, you, this, this is where you get hold of us. You know, this might, you know my website, and that's uh, that, that's uh, one of the many homes of Rick Morris. I'm, you know, I'm sure Rick will agree. If there's if there's stuff people want to talk to us about after us, we will we will happily connect with them. Hit us up. Um, if we're not connected on LinkedIn, make sure you do. Um, but thank you for your time, your interest, and, and honestly, good luck with your writing projects from this point forwards. Thank you very Can't much. Can't wait to read them. Yeah. We'll see you, gang. All right. Bye. All right. Thanks, Peter. All right. Cheers, Rick. Thank you. Bye. Bye.